Good news and bad news, Mitchell. What do you want first? Uh, bad. Well, let's, start with bad news. Let's, say, let's start with bad news. It's, just, it's a food Sunday, and it's a seven-page sermon. They're typically five and a half. The good news is page seven is blank. I don't know why it printed out. So that's the good news. Perfectly. All right. Brenda's got the wee ones downstairs. Um, that's good because this is a very serious topic we have to talk about. Anyway, um, what we're going to do is we're going to start by going over the Ten Commandments. And remember, we're trying to memorize them together. So we're memorizing the prologue. We're memorizing the reference and the Ten Commandments. We're up to the seventh one. And Mitchell, remind me. Remind me. What happens if somebody stands up before all the church and God and says the reference, the prologue, and the Ten Commandments. What happens to them? Uh, what happens to them? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let's go through it together. Randy, are we, are we ready to rock and roll? Great. All right. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. Do not have any other gods but me. Do not make for yourself an idol. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. All right. How many of you guys know who C.S. Lewis is? C.S. Lewis is probably my favorite. Last night I said he's one of three of my favorite authors. I'll just, at, by this point today, C.S. Lewis is my favorite author. Um, his book, Mere Christianity, is single handed aside from the Bible, it is the book that has radically changed my life and my theology of how I relate to God. And um, one of his other, one of my other favorite books of his is The Screw Tape Letters. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, I, I do too. Um, in The Screw Tape Letters, for those of you who don't know, um, it is a a book of letters written by written from Screw Tape, who is a demon in hell who writes letters to his nephew who has gone out into the world and his main purpose is to lead people away from God. So it's kind of it's kind of a how to be a Christian book but written in reverse. It's very fascinating and it's very insightful. And at the end of writing it um or which I guess at the beginning of the book and the forward CS Lewis is talking about having written the book and he said that the number one question that he has always received is will you ever write a sequel? And CS Lewis said this um, in order to get in the mindset of screw tape, he had to put his mind in one of the darkest places it's ever been. And he said it was a difficult time. It was a miserable time. And he said that he couldn't wait to get done with that book faster than he could. And he said once he got done with it, um, it was just like stepping into light for the first time. In many ways, that's how I felt about today's sermon. Today's sermon is not is, some sermons I enjoy preaching. They're fun. Today's sermon is not a fun sermon to preach, and it's not been a fun sermon to have to research and study. In fact, this has been the hardest sermon I've ever done. Um, when we went through the book of Daniel about a year ago, um, there was one Sunday, one of the chapters took me 40 hours of research to do. It was the most research I've ever done for a sermon in my life. I loved it. If I could have spent 80 hours on it, I would have. This one about every five minutes, I found an excuse to just quit working on it because I, I didn't like it. This is a miserable topic to talk about. And I was sharing with my, um, I have a church coach who helps me with things. So if you're like, Jeff, you're a terrible pastor. Well, I'll, I'll let you call him. <laughs> you can talk to him about it. But anyway, I was kind of sharing with him what I was talking about today. And he, he said this, he's like, my number one question is this, how do you address a topic that our culture says, says is a victimless thing? How do you preach that in your church? I said, that's a good question, because this is a subject that many in our culture, if you were to ask the average person, they would say, there's really nothing wrong with it. It's a victimless thing. So today, let's just shoot with it. Um, today, we're going to talk about the danger of pornography. 
Um, first question, you know me, we always start with asking a question. What is pornography? Well, pornography or porn or porno, whatever you want to call it, is any printed or visual material that is intended to elicit a sexual response from someone. This can be books that have no pictures in them whatsoever. It can be magazines. It can be movies. It can be internet websites. Anything that's purpose is to create a sexual response in a person's life is pornography. Um, the pornography industry is a massive industry. So here's some, these statistics, this was the first time, this is like, I'm done. I, I, three minutes into the sermon, I was like, I'm done, Shelby. I just got to take like a, a three-day break. Um, the pornography industry is a $97 billion industry worldwide. Um, in the U.S. alone, it is a $13 billion industry. Um, four out of five 16-year-olds regularly view pornography. This is this is crazy. 74% of porn websites have explicit pornography on the homepage before you even have to log in to show how old you are. That's insane. Average age of we can do we can do question answer for this one. Um, what do you guys think is the average age um, for a person who views hardcore pornography for the first time? Too old. You're close though. Too young. It's 11. The average age for the person who views hardcore pornography the first time is 11 years old. That's younger than Jeff. Jeffrey, how old are you? 13. Yeah, that's younger than Jeffrey. And this one, th these all blow my mind, but I think this one hurts hurt, hurts a lot just because this has to do with the church. Um, the Barna Group did a study a few years back that said that 64% of Christian men claim to view pornography at least once a month. For those of you who enjoy doing statistics, I looked this up real quick. Um, today we have nine guys in the congregation. That would mean statistically um, between five and six of us guys in our church would be addicted to pornography. Isn't that crazy? Because we would say in a congregation this small, maybe one or two, actually it would be the majority of men. Uh, and that's not counting the guys that we don't have here today, which I could have done how many anyway. And um, that's not including how many people do we have who watch online. And so the question that we want to ask today is, why are we talking about this? Um, when we started this series on sexual ethics, one of the things I said is one of the biggest problems that I've seen in the church is the church's refusal to talk about these hard topics. But the reality is we have to talk about these because with pornography, this isn't just something that you do and it has no effect on your life whatsoever. Pornography dramatically affects your life, the life of those around you, the life of people involved in making it. And then as we'll see at the end, it will affect people that in many ways have nothing to do with pornography. And so today's sermon um, is specifically for if you're addicted to pornography, if this is something that you cannot live without. And it's interesting that the Barna Group defines being addicted is if you look at it once a month, you're addicted. This is for people who are tempted. I'm interested in it, and I feel like every time I get on the computer, that ad pops up, and I just, I just hover over it, thinking this through. What if someone walks in? What if someone's good? This is for those who are curious about. It. I'm not currently looking at it, but I'm, I'm intrigued with it. And this is for those who have never been exposed to it, and you're like, what in the world are you even talking about? This is for all the church because this is something that we have to address. And so today we're going to look at it from different perspectives. What are the spiritual consequences of pornography? What are the psychological, those actually go together, the spiritual and the psychological consequences of pornography? What are the eternal consequences of pornography? What are the social consequences of pornography? Um, like I said, next week we're going to be having a guest speaker who will kind of talk more about the social aspects of pornography and um, I don't know if we'll video, I'll, ha I'll have to talk with Randy and I were talking about this. This might be too sensitive to put online, so we might not broadcast next week, but we'll, we'll talk with her and see what she says. Anyway, the first thing that we want to deal with is the um, eternal consequences of pornography. So if you have your Bibles with you, this was our passage for last week. It actually could have been our passage for this whole series. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. Matthew 5, verse 27. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. We talked last week about when Jesus talks about adultery, Jesus is more concerned with guys who are stealing other men's wives. Jesus is concerned about that seed of evil in your heart that makes you want to lust in general. Jesus isn't concerned with these symptoms. He wants to address the very specific nature of adultery. And what's interesting is Jesus is very clear. If you commit adultery, if you lust, the consequence is you will go to hell. He doesn't sugarcoat it. In fact, he uses some of the most graphic, intense language in all of Scripture. He says, if you were going to go to hell, it would be better for you to slice off your hand or pluck out your eye than to go to hell, which Shelley would say, please make sure that you stress that he's being very hyperbolic in this. And he's just saying, if there's anything in your life, you need to get rid of it as quickly as possible. And he would, and she said, do not physically cut your hands and eyeballs out. So Randy, if you come in next week with your eyes gone, I'm going to say, Randy, I don't think you understood what Jesus is saying. We probably should have clarified a little bit better. All right. If you're confused, please call me before you do anything drastic and just say, Jeff, real quick, explain that. Okay. I would love to. Why is it that a person who lusts and a person who commits adultery goes to hell? That seems a little cliche. But the reality is that when we use people for our own gratification, that is not what the kingdom of God is like. What is the kingdom of God like? The kingdom of God is where you go to people and you serve them. You love them. You lift them up. You elevate them. You let, you remind them they have status and worth in God's sight and that Jesus has died for their sins and that you want to love them. At no point in the kingdom of God are we ever encouraged to use people for any reason People are not objects to be used. People are not obstacles to get out of your way. If that's how you view people, that's wrong. That's evil. And that's what pornography does. Pornography reduces people. <clears throat> and I, I, when I wrote through my sermon last night, I realized I am writing this from the dude's perspective. So if you're not a dude, just apply it as necessary. But from pornography turns women into objects to be used. And that's not what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of purity, a kingdom of goodness, and it's a kingdom of beauty. And if we do things that go against the purity and the goodness of the kingdom of God, there's no place for that kind of stuff. There's no place for sexual morality. It doesn't fit in God's kingdom. So this is what Paul writes in Colossians 3, 5-6. through 6. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So how does God view sexual immorality? It is something for him to arrive and destroy. What about impurity or lust? Well, this is also something that God is going to arrive and uh, arrive for and destroy. 1 Corinthians 6, 8-10 through 10. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. What does Paul say? Well, first, he says, if you are living in sexual immorality, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I said, and Paul says this, don't be deceived. You're living in deception. If you continue to live in sin, there's no place for that in the kingdom of God. If you continue to live in sexual immorality, I do whatever I want with who I want because those people are objects for me to be used. Paul says, that's not how the kingdom of God operates. You can't go into the kingdom of God with that mentality and expect to thrive and survive there. That's ludicrous. And secondly, at writing to the church, he says, that kind of sexual immorality, that's how you used to live. Jesus died so that you could be set free from that, flee from that lifestyle. So first, the first consequence of pornography is that there are eternal consequences to it, that there is no place in the kingdom of God for sexual immorality. Secondly, viewing pornography will harden your soul. 
Um, Jesus tells us very clearly that lusting after others is wrong. So now that we know that, we're held accountable to that knowledge. And if we hear that knowledge and we reject that knowledge, we harden our hearts against God's voice. If you were to read the book of Hebrews, it constantly says that if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in um, the days of Meribah and Massa, where the Israelites heard God speaking to them. And instead of wanting to hear God, they begin to shut him out and ignore him. How many of you guys, th this is going to make us all sound old. Oh my goodness. How many of you guys remember those old radiator heaters? We had them in our school. They were, I don't even know, they were like this big and this tall. And if you accidentally touched it or someone bumped you into it, it'd like burn off your arm. How many of you guys remember those? Those are super quiet, weren't they? Ours were so loud. Like all of it would be pop, pop, crack. They were so loud. One of the teachers has one at school. And like I was in his room the other day talking and it just started clanging. It scared me so bad. I was like, <gasps> It's like, oh, it's just my heater. It scared me. We had one of those. My school was like 100 years old. And I'm not, that's not me. It, it literally was like 100 years old. They ended up shutting it down because it got too old. Anyway, I digress. Um, one of the things, though, is we had those old radiator heaters. And I remember in the music group, in the music room, it was especially loud. Pop, crack, hiss. <laughs> all these crazy noises. And it was super distracting. And every time the teacher would start to say something, it'd get interrupted. But something interesting happened halfway through the year. We quit hearing that noise. And so one day, one kid raised their hand, Mrs. Rolfing, did they fix your heater? And she said, no. And we're like, well, it's so quiet now. And she said, of course it's not quiet. It's still as loud as it was the first day of school. And the kid's like, we don't hear. And she said, everyone just be quiet. And we were quiet. And guess what? Pop, crack, hip. And I'm like, but we didn't notice it. And she said, well, that's because over time, when you have things you don't want to hear, you will learn to tune them out. How many? Oh, no. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to ask it. I'm going to ask it. Men. How many, how many guys tune out your wife? <laughs> now, let me ask it so we all look back. Ladies, how many of you guys have learned to tune out your husband? Yeah, yeah. That's what hardening your heart is. That When God says something you don't want to hear, you plug your ears or you just quit listening. And over time, the author of Hebrews says, if you continue to ignore God's voice like that, what's eventually going to happen? You're going to get to the point where you do not hear him. And you're like, God never speaks to me. God never shows up. If God were to show up, I would follow him right now. Well, just like the radiator, God has always been speaking to you. You've just got to the point where you quit listening to his voice because I don't know, stubborn pride, willful ignorance, who knows, whatever. When we know that lust and adultery is wrong and we continue to do it and we continue to ignore God's voice, it damages our soul. It makes it, it, makes it harder to hear God's voice in those times. Secondly, um, when it comes to this idea of the spiritual and psychological consequences of pornography, um, it corrupts our very soul. That you guys know in Genesis chapter 1, God creates all the animals of the world. And there's a special creature that out of all these animals, he lifts it up. He elevates it and gives it a special status. And that creature is, it's man. I, I was afraid someone was going to say parrots or penguins. No, you're wrong. It's man. God has elevated humanity above all the other animals. He has created us to be in his image, which means that we reflect his love, which you see, be fruitful, multiply. We reflect his kingly reign when he says, rule over all the earth as he rules over creation. And we reflect God's holiness and ethics when he says, eat from this tree, don't eat from this one. God breathes life into us. He molds us with his own hands. We are made in the image of God. But when we sin, we lower ourselves from that image of God that he's created us in, and we engage in the lifestyle of the animal kingdom. It's interesting that when Paul talks about the sinful nature, there's usually two things that the, his descriptions fall in. They're either things of violence or things of sexual morality. If you don't hate, don't have rage, don't cause quarreling, don't fight, those are all things that characterize violence. And he says, don't lust, don't be impure, don't commit adultery, don't be sexually immoral. These things fall in the sexual category. So Paul is saying that when we sin, we're engaging in animal-like behavior. We're just giving into our biological urges, and we're lowering ourselves from the status that God has created us in, 
and we've stooped to something that we shouldn't be. We become like the animal kingdom. Don't do it. The third aspect of spiritual and psychological consequences is that porn is highly addictive and many men fall into a cycle of shame because of it. That, and you know, we've all been to like Walmart or these stores that have all these, what I call the girly magazines up front. You can't buy candy without seeing them. And it's interesting. And one of the things that pornography does is they always have the women looking directly at you. It's fascinating. If you look at you go to Walmart and notice that all the women on all these magazines, where do they stare? They stare straight into your eyes because this is a judgment-free magazine. This, this magazine is not going to judge what you look like. It's not going to judge how smart you are or how dumb you are. It's not going to judge you on this. This is She's not going to back talk you. She's not going to have any demands. She definitely doesn't come with any baggage attached. It's just a magazine. And it gives this false illusion that this magazine or this video has all the solutions that you could pop possibly ask for with no talk back, no demands. You take it, you use it, and when you're done, what have I done? I've done something shameful. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned, what do they immediately do? They hide. They're embarrassed. What have I done? We need to hide from somebody. We need to hide from each other. We need to hide from God. And so pornography causes shame for those who watch it. But this is the catch that you've used it. You're ashamed of it. But because of that shame, you can't go to other people and talk about because what would they think about me if they do? And so who's the only one there that has no judgment and just no baggage? None of this is that pornography again. So you go back to it and it causes more shame and more isolation, more insecurity. And so you go back to it. And it's just this constant cycle that just keeps going further and further and further down. It destroys you psychologically and it destroys you spiritually. So there's eternal consequences. Jesus says if you engage in sexual immorality, that the consequence of that is hell. Two, there are spiritual and psychological consequences to it. It's going to destroy your soul. It's going to harden your heart towards God. And it's going to cause a cycle of shame and guilt that you're not going to be able to get out of on your own. <clears throat> the third consequence, and I, I really don't even know how to do this, or eternal one, that makes sense. Spiritual, psychological. I really don't, I didn't know how to word this one. So the third consequence is it ruins the beauty of women. And again, can women look at pornography? Absolutely. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, and I didn't, I was just tired of looking up statistics on pornography. So I just, I didn't want to, but if I'm not mistaken, I believe that the number of men who are addicted to pornography and the number of women are not that different. All right. So um, you can say this destroys the, the, the beauty of men as well. But again, I'm a dude, so I'm going to look at this from a dude's perspective. My understanding of Genesis chapter 1 is as follows. And you can disagree with me if you want to. I still think I'm right. But we can have over brownies and sweet tea. We can debate with each other and see who comes out on top. But anyway, my interpretation of Genesis chapter 1 is that each day gets bigger and better than the last. All right. I think I've shared this before. Day 1, God creates light, which I cannot create. I can turn on a light switch. It's not the same. I can't say light and it happens. I have to walk across the room or say, Randy, will you turn the lights on then turn them back? Yeah, okay. I can't create light. But what's cooler is on day four, God takes that light and then he begins to divide it up and he makes suns and stars and he begins to create um, planetary things that reflect light all over the universe. All these cool designs in the heavens. On day two, God separates the sky from the sea but on day five, he creates all the birds to fill the sky and he creates all the animals that live in water. That's cool. Day three, God creates or he separates the land from um, the sea. But on day six, he fills that with all kinds of wildlife. Wildlife that how do you even come? How do you even come up with the duck billed platypus? God's like, oh, man, I need one more thing, but I want it to be different. Jesus, what if we took a duck and we took a beaver and put them together? Who's going to say anything? It's cool. Anyway, so each day seems to get bigger and better than the last, but animals aren't the last thing that God creates, is it? There's one more thing he's going to create, and he creates man. And you could even say this, 
But Adam's not the last thing that God creates, is it? The last thing that God creates in that creation week is woman. And so if everything is building to the, to the, the great climax of creation, if that's how we should read it, then woman is the most beautiful thing that God's made. Now, I will agree with that because if you had a beauty contest, I hope that my wife would outbeat me. I, I don't, I, what is it that we say that this is my better half? Do we, you guys say that Shelly is by far my better half. She looks better. She's fun. Well, I'd like to think I'm funnier. She often reminds me, Jeff, no one thinks you're as funny as you think you do. I don't know. But anyway, there is a beauty and a mystique and a, a quality of women that is to be revered. Like how many passages in the Bible just talk about the greatness of women. It's wonderful. However, what does pornography do to the beauty of women? It cheapens it. It sells it. It markets it. And it ruins. Women are created in this beautiful image of God. And women and men are to come along together in marriage and <clears throat> create life and enjoy life together and worship God and follow God wherever He leads them together. And pornography ruins that idea. And it just cheapens women to be objects to be used for a moment of sexual gratification. And that's never what God intended for anyone to be. And you can flip it and say the same thing with men. Men are not meant to be lusted upon and just stared and turned into objects. One of the articles I read was saying that, oh, there's no direct correlation between men who look at pornography and how they treat women. And they gave some statistics. But, you know, Sometimes I think statistics are just kind of pulled out of the hat because the reality is every man that I've ever met and talked to who has viewed pornography, guess how they treat women? They treat them like garbage. And maybe I shouldn't say this. They treat them, I'll just say they treat them like poop. They treat them badly. And so say what you want about your statistics. I've never experienced a man that viewed pornography and said, boy, I value the beauty and the feminine mystique of women and I elevate them to a special set. I've never heard that. What I've heard is men who view pornography refer to women only as their body parts. We don't do that. We don't reduce people to the parts of their body that can help us out. That's wrong. Um, in many cases, another thing that we could talk about is that in the case of pornography, it holds women to a standard that cannot be achieved in real life. Whether we think of it this way, pornography, these are movies, and movies are designed to make everything look better. Like, how many guys have ever, I know this is a weird, uh, a weird thing to relate it to. How many guys have ever seen like commercials for food? And it's like, I've never bought food from McDonald's that looked that good. Like, you see a McDonald's commercial, I do not care for McDonald's. I like their chicken McNuggets, which that's technically, I like their hot sauce or their hot mustard. And to get the hot mustard, you have to get the chicken McNugget. Okay, it's a, it's a catch-20. Anyway, but you see these sandwiches, and it's like, man, that actually makes me want to go to McDonald's. And then you order the same sandwich, and it looks like they dug it out of the bottom of a trash can, and they threw it sideways into the wrapper, and they had an, uh, a chimpanzee who was just born wrap it up and drop it in the bag and then dump your French fries on it upside down and maybe give you ketchup if you ask for it. But that's how movies are. Movies are designed to be the best version of everything. It's like when you watch Christmas movies, it's like, wow, that movie look, makes Christmas look so magical and great. Why can't we have Christmas? Well, they've just spent like millions of dollars to make this the most magical looking Christmas. And I know those are kind of crude illustrations to use for our topic at hand. But with pornography, these are magazines and movies and websites that are purposely trying to make this look as glamorous as possible, but it's completely unrealistic. And if you go to those things, instead of going to, again, I'm a dude, so I'll talk to my dudes. If you look at those things, instead of going to your wife, what does that say to your wife? Wife, you don't satisfy me like this magazine cover does, or wife, you can never please me in a way that this video does. What does that say to a woman? You're garbage. I'm going to use, the, I'm, I'd rather go to this garbage then go to you. That's a horrible, horrible way to make a woman feel about herself. And I would suggest this. I would even suggest that if you could get those people that were in those videos and those magazines and have five or ten minutes with them, that's still not going to be 
what that movie is like because that's manufactured and unrealistic. That's not true. People are true. Another aspect of the destruction of women that pornography leads to, Shelly and I were talking with, uh, with someone one time, and she had mentioned that basically she was a sex slave to her own husband, that her husband would watch pornography and then force her to act these things out. I had a guy I worked with, he did the same thing. He would make his girlfriend watch pornography with him, and then he would force her to do everything that they saw in the video. That's not what sex is meant to be. We saw that sex is meant to create life and to make both people feel enlivened and then to create life. Pornography steals that from people. This is, this is not about us. This isn't about you feeling enlivened. This is about me viewing something and forcing you to do what I want. I mean, even outside of the context of sex, there's no part of Christianity where we say that. This is all about me, and you do what I want. Like, if I said that as a pastor, Shelby, as the pastor of this church, you do what I want. I don't care what your tradition. That'd be horrible. I hope you would say, Jeff, you're fired. You know, right on the back. That's not how we treat people in the kingdom of God. You know, I'm the dad of this family. You do what I want, kids. You brats. Kids, I hope you would say, okay, well, you could say that, but you're not getting any more Christmas presents or birthday presents, Dad. You still would have. You'd be like, Dad, I got this because I love you in Jesus' name. But we, we don't treat people like that in the kingdom of God. We especially do not treat people like that in the context of sex. This is what I want, and you do what I want or else. That robs women, or on the flip side, if the woman's addicted to porn, it, it robs the husband of the joy of marriage and the joy of sex. That's not serving. And so we've seen that um, there's eternal consequences to pornography. There's psychological and spiritual consequences to it. And there are consequences in our relationship and our view of women. And I think I should have looked at what time we started, but I did not. But we'll just, we'll, we'll knock this out real quick. The fourth one is, this that there are social consequences to pornography. Um, at this point, in doing this, I just got tired of looking up gross statistics, Ellie. I'm sorry. So, the next one this is just basically um, this is a paper that Andrew David Nacelli um, gave. He's an assistant professor of New Testament and biblical theology at Bethlehem College and Seminary, and he gives some statistics about stuff that we might not think about with pornography. And so, I'd just like to share a couple insights from him. Um, one thing he says is that research clearly demonstrates a clear link between sex traffic and the production of pornography. We live in a world that is rampant with the sex trade. Even Ruth, we were talking about this today, that one of, what was it, Poland? One of Poland's fears is with all these kids coming into their country, they're scared to death. Those kids are going to be, they're going to end up in the sex trade. This is a horrible epidemic in our world. Um and Nasali, one of the things he points out is that pornography fuels the sex trade. Um, he says that federal legislation has acknowledged this. People who are in porn videos have acknowledged this. And um, he said that one anti-trafficker center that's trying to stop the sex traffic says that at least one third of people that are trafficked for sex are used in making pornographic videos. So one out of at one out of three porn stars in a porn video are a sex slave. Um, the same article reports that 900 women who were rescued from the sex trade were, were interviewed. Half of those women, so about 450 women, said that while they were being raped in the sex trade, they were being videotaped, and those videos were made into pornography. Um, and one of the things that Nasali says that um, researchers and this have said is that the more people watch pornography, the more it makes a demand for sex trafficking. And the more sex trafficking there is, the more pornography is made, and the more pornography is made. And so he said the two go together. You can't have one without the other. And one of the articles I read said, if you wanted to end the sex traffic industry almost overnight, you could just completely make pornography illegal and just get rid of it. And it said it would, it would slice sex trafficking in half. Um, one of the things uh, that Nasali writes is that this, uh, most prostitutes, are sex slaves. And um, he talks about how often some guy will kind of trick these women into a better life. And so they trust them, they build a relationship with them, and then they end up getting kidnapped. Um, he says sometimes people kidnap children, adolescent women, and force them into prostitution. And um, what happens is, and this this made me so sad to read. Like I said, I, I hated this sermon with every fiber of my being. 
one of the things that he said is that what happens is these women are kidnapped and they're forced into sex some way, shape or form, and it breaks their spirits. And after a while of being raped, they just give up and they're like, I have no worth. Obviously, if people are treating me like garbage, if people are only the only interested in me because of my body parts, I have no value and worth. And remember, how much worth do we have because of God creating us? We have an, an immense amount of worth. In fact, I would say that humans, we are God's master. I mean, even Paul says that for you are God's masterpiece or workmanship or craftsmanship, or uh, if you want to say the Greek word, poema. What does that mean? Well, it just means masterpiece. I just want to sound smart. This is how God views us. But when we prostitute people, it reduces them to a cheap thrill and whatever body parts I need for what I need. And when women, children, even men are treated that way, it destroys their sense of worth and they're just like, who cares? Who cares? And they just give up. Um, more and more women who escape the bondage of sex slavery testify that pornography has fueled the sex slavery. And this is what um, my friend Mrs. Barrett will talk about next week. She's going to talk about the correlation between um, sex slavery and pornography, and the two go together and cannot be separated. Um, women that are um, kidnapped and forced into the sex slavery are often forced to pose nude for photographs and into her acts of sex for film. And the, here's the word. They have to act like they're enjoying it so they can make money. Um, not only are many of the women in pornographic pictures and films themselves sex slaves, but then the sex slaves, as they capture more children and teenagers, they force them to watch the pornography they've made so that they can know what to do with their adult customers. Um, the reality is, if you're engaging in pornography, you are fueling the sex industry. You're basically saying, I want to watch these horrible crimes, and I want to help pay for these crimes, and so I'm just going to watch pornography. So if you're engaging in pornography, you're engaging in a very evil activity. It's not a choice that you're, there's no, oh, this is just a victimless crime. These are, porn is made by victims of the sex trade. And to say that they're not victims, I would say that you have a, a, a childish caricature, a caricature of what prostitution and sex slavery is. Um, and let's see. Um, one person said that pornography is to the sex trade as gasoline is to your car. You can have the nicest car in the world, but if you don't have gas, where are you going? You're going nowhere. You're stuck in the middle of the intersection in Circleville asking your friends, help me push my car to the gas station. But um, they said the same thing with the sex trade, that um, pornography is what creates the demand for the sex trade. And so that being said, this is a miserable sermon. And it's a miserable sermon because this is something we don't want to talk about. But the reality is we have to talk about it, guys. We can't, we can't, you know, like in the old, I, was it like Looney Tunes, Ron, where the ostrich would get scared and the ostrich would just cram its head under the ground? Yeah, we've all seen that image. And I think that's what the church has done with sexual ethics. We're just scared. I don't want people to call me homophobic, so I'm just going to not, I'm not going to talk about it or we go the opposite. I'm just going to be angry and not know what the Bible says. I just want, ah. and I think with the porn industry, this is something we don't even want, we don't even want to acknowledge. We know well we shouldn't do it, but apparently, 64 percent of Christian men do. This is something that, as a church, we have to deal with, and hopefully, we don't specifically have to deal with. But we have to talk about this: that if you're viewing pornography, there are very real eternal consequences to viewing porn. Paul says you cannot go into the kingdom of heaven if you look at pornography. To make it very simple, you will go to hell if you look at pornography. And you can say, well, but I said a prayer like 28,000 years ago. Paul says, don't be deceived. If you view pornography, you'll go to hell. It will destroy your soul. Because what are you going to do in the kingdom of God? Look at pornography? Hey, Jesus, one second. I'll get to worship in a moment. I need to go check this out. Paul says there is no there is no sexual morality in the kingdom of God. So if that's if sexual immorality characterizes your life, that life cannot be part of the kingdom. You need Jesus wants to deal with that and bring you into his kingdom, but that has to go. Secondly, there are spiritual and psychological consequences to pornography. It's ex insanely addicting that once you get into it, it just starts this cycle of shame that you cannot get out. 
And what's interesting is even with most Christian men that are addicted to pornography, almost all of them have had to have out. I mean, yes, Jesus, that's the motivation to get help, but they've all had to have someone come into their life outside of themselves to get them out of pornography. It's insanely addicting. It hardens our hearts when God whispers, don't do this, don't do this. And when God whispers and we say no, it hardens our heart where we can't hear his voice. And like my fifth grade class, I don't hear the radiator or what some of you would call the radiator. I don't hear the radiator anymore. Well, it's always been making noise. It's just that you've you've conditioned yourself to quit hearing it. It destroys how we view women. Um, I'll, I'll be safe. My wife is the most beautiful person in the entire world. That's true. I would say that we, all women are beautiful, but I don't want controversy. There's just something, there's something beautiful. And I would say the same thing with me. God has created people to be beautiful. All right. But there's, it's gross. But um, when we view pornography, we're trading very real women and we're creating a, we're looking at, at, at manufactured women. This isn't real. And it cheapens how we view other people. And we don't, if if no one can measure up to this standard of this lady, hubba, hubba, ooh, la, la, then I don't want anything to do with her. Oh, my goodness. Did you, oh, this is, that's not real. This is manufactured. It causes men that are, um, men that view pornography, it causes them to treat women poorly. They don't treat them as women who have been made in the image of God, they treat them like objects to be used. And my, not even that much. You're The only thing you're good for is a couple body parts. And other than that, I'm dismissed with you. You're done. That's horrible. And lastly, we saw that there are um, societal consequences to pornography. Even if you say, I don't care about my soul. Even if you say, I don't care about hell. I can deal with that on my deathbed. All right. I'll play the odds. Even if that's your attitude, which is a, a terrible attitude to have, by the way, even if that's your attitude, pornography fuels the sex industry. Thousands, millions of people are captured. And we've heard in the past couple of years these raids on these houses, and hundreds of kids are rescued from the sex trade. Pornography directly fuels that. And so one of the articles that I read said this you can't say that the sex trade is bad and evil and view pornography and say you're the good guy. He said, if you're viewing pornography, you are, you're throwing money at the sex trade and encouraging it to happen. So what I would suggest is this. Today, um, if, what were my, I had four categories. It's just better to look at my notes. If you're addicted to pornography, you need to be set free from it. One of the things that God hates is God hates his people to be in bondage. If you're in bondage to pornography, you need to be set free. You need to repent of looking at it, confess it to Jesus, and turn away. Say, God, help me be set free from this. If you're tempted with it, you're not looking at pornography, but you've been waiting. And every time you get on there, and it's like, I was just looking up recipes for, I don't know, tuna noodle, tuna noodle casserole. And that, that popped up, and I hovered over it, and I was... I was sweating and saying, no, don't do this. But what if I did? But what if I, if you're being tempted to look at pornography, you need to go to the Lord and ask for strength to get through it. You need to say, God, help me not to give into this because I know the consequence of this is going to far outweigh whatever the next five or 10 minutes is going to be. Lastly, not lastly, if you're curious about pornography, you're not looked at, you're not really tempted, but I'm intrigued to see what it even is. I minister to a young man. That's how he started. He was just curious. He's like, I've never seen pornography before. I was curious what the draw was. And he clicked on a couple. Or, Don't do that. If you're curious, just walk away from it and say, this is hazardous and there's consequences to my soul. And if you've never been exposed to pornography, I would say, great. We live in a culture that plasters it everywhere. Like I said, even when you go to Walmart and you're trying to decide, do I want, do I want um, normal M&Ms, which you never do, or peanut butter M&Ms, which you always do. The peanut butter M&Ms are insane. It's like, how is this even still an M&M? This is gore. Anyway, I digress. You're surrounded by it. Even when you go to buy your calendar for the new year, if you're not careful, it's mixed in the calendars. If you've never been exposed to it, I say praise God that God has kept you from being exposed to it. That's amazing, especially in our culture. But if you've never been exposed to it, just continue to pray. God, keep me um, free from it. Keep it out of my life. And help me 
have a covenant in my eyes not to lust after other, other women, or if you're a woman, not to lust after other men. Or I guess I could, I should even say this: just don't lust after anybody. Pornography is insanely addictive. It's insanely dangerous. And can you get through? I think you're going to need Jesus's help to get through it. So, Jesse, if you will, will you cut our feed now? And then we'll just close out with an unbroadcast prayer. I think that'd be okay. So what I'm going to ask is, like I said, sit.